Well, it's been a number of years that through uh, Professor James Lyon and the Department of German and Professor Ted Lyon that I've heard about this legendary Kennedy Center MA graduate, James M.B. Lyon. Uh, I heard from time to time about his exploits uh, with the International Crisis Group and uh, in, in working on a number of very interesting projects. And just a few weeks ago, I was able to meet him, and I'm pleased to introduce him to you today. He, uh, James M.B. Lyon is an associate researcher at the University of Graz in Austria, uh, and he's an, a senior associate in advising the Demo Democratization Policy Council. He founded and runs the Foundation for the Preservation of Historical Heritage, which is currently digitizing the holdings of both the National Library and Historical Museum in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He has spent 22 years in conflict and post-conflict regions in the Balkans and Africa, and has worked on EU, USAID, and UNDP projects. These included implementing the Dayton Peace Ag Agreement in Bosnia and Herzegovina, working to topple Serbia's dictator Slob Slob Slobodan Milosevic, and helping to resolve guerrilla insurgencies in South Serbia and Macedonia, facilitating Montenegro and Kosovo's independence, and reconciliation in the Sanzak for a decade, directing Balkan projects for the International Crisis Group. He assisted the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in gaining legal recognition in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where he served as director of the Corporation of the President of the Church and established and oversaw a three-and-a-half-year genealogy project for family search in the Balkans. Another topic for another day, but also an interesting one from what I've learned. As an accomplished political analyst and historian, he's written three books, many scholarly articles, dozens of published reports for think tanks, numerous op-eds, and has testified before the U.S. Congress and parliament parliamentary panels of various U.N. member states. His next book is Serbia and the Balkan Front, 1914, The Outbreak of the Great War, coming from Bloomsbury in 2015. He served an LDS mission to Yugoslavia, received a B.A. in Russian Language and Literature and an M.A. in International Relations from the Kennedy Center at BYU, and a Ph.D. in Balkan History from UCLA. He currently resides in Belgrade, Serbia, and we welcome his family that also is accompanying him today. As I mentioned, the title of his presentation today, Don't Worry About the Balkans, Only the Odd-Numbered World Wars Start There, Sarajevo, 1914 to 2014. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James M. B. Lyon. I'd like to thank the Kennedy Center for having me and BYU for having me back. It's really nice to be able to come back uh, after so many years. I was here when a guy named Steve Young was quarterback and then again when Robbie Bosco took the Cougars to the national championship and at that time I must admit I engaged in a number of activities that probably uh, had they come to the official knowledge of the university would have gotten me dismissed on honor code charges for example. Um, following the national championship, some friends and I uh, climbed up Y Mountain and put a big number one next to the Y. <clears throat> and that same year, we also climbed up and painted the U at the University of Utah bright blue. So when it came out in their annual publication, uh, the president of the University of Utah was photographed at the commencement speech that was held outdoors, standing against a backdrop of a bright blue U on the hillside. Uh, but I do not repent or apologize for those actions. <laughs> <clears throat> Today is going to be a bit of a mashup. I'm going to be taking you through events of 1914 and trying to make some of them relevant to the present. I'm going to try to discuss some of the lessons we have and haven't learned, but especially try to uh, help you understand not only why history is important, but also why uh, today's current events and the failure of many policymakers to understand the context of history and the context of current events can lead to some other, uh, shall we say, catastrophic decisions that are made in what is often termed the national interest. Now, the summer of 1914 is often portrayed as peaceful and uneventful, a time when few suspected war was on the horizon, much less a full-blown world war that would draw in people from across the globe. Yet it was neither peaceful nor uneventful. By that summer, Europe had been engaged in conflict for two years, and in low-intensity guerrilla warfare for 10. 
and had just recently intervened in the northern Albanian city of Shkodr, or Skadar, to dislodge Montenegrin and Serbian forces. This war that had already begun in the Balkans would soon draw in all of Europe, including countries as far away as Japan, and eventually come full circle in 1918 to end as a result of military developments in the Balkans, not on the Western Front. Just as today, the world order then was changing. Old empires and alliances tottered, while new forces elbowed their way onto the stage. Along Europe's periphery, change was occurring at a disturbingly fast pace driven by unresolved national questions, social economic frustration, popular unrest, and nationalist leaders. Threats of irredentism, independence, and state dissolution rattled Balkan and great power nerves alike. Some of those in power seemed oblivious to the winds of change and clung to their privileges and patronage networks, while others pushed for or ignored badly needed reforms to shore up crumbling systems and ideologies. During the 19th century, one overriding issue preoccupied the great powers, the Eastern question, that is, the collapse of the ever-weakening Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> in practical terms, this meant that each great power looked to assure its interests in the territories of the collapsing Ottoman Empire. We can see a political cartoon here from that era that shows everyone knew fully well what was going on and where the trouble would come from. Yet the contested areas of the Ottoman Empire, and think of these areas in light of today's events, were Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, the Gulf states, North Africa, and the Balkans. And they were all in a state of flux. As the sublime port's power weakened in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, subjugated areas of the empire began to rebel. In the Balkans alone, the 99 years between the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and 1914, Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, Montenegro, and Serbia emerged as nation states from the ruins of the disintegrating Ottoman Empire. Here's a map from 1914 to give you an idea of uh, where these new st every one of these colored states had been a part of the Ottoman Empire up until the 19th century. In contrast, the great powers subjugated the former Ottoman lands of North Africa, albeit not without the great powers raising substantial tensions among themselves. The great powers were forced to deal with aggressive programs of national liberation and expansion throughout the Balkans. In 1914, influential elements in both Austria, Hungary, and Serbia pressed diametrically opposed geopolitical and national aims that, that contemplated future programs of territorial expansion at each other's expense. Conflict seemed inevitable. Given this atmosphere, one could well ask why war did not break out earlier, not merely why a small regional quarrel spread into a conflagration that enveloped the entire world. Since June 28, 1914, Tens of thousands of articles and books have been published in numerous languages in an effort to explain the causes of the Great War. When viewed through the prism of Balkan sources, the events of 1914 help us better understand modern-day Balkan political pathologies as well as current events elsewhere. The nature of participation in the war First World War by each country has left lasting and indelible marks on cultural and political identity particularly in those states that emerged from the ruins of the Austro-Hungarian, German, Ottoman, and Russian empires. Yet nothing places an old war in perspective like a new war. Although 100 years have passed since the Sarajevo assassination, the scars of the Second World War and the more recent wars of Yugoslav dissolution remain fresh in the collective memories of the Balkan peoples. These scars have reinforced heavily politicized and polarized views of events surrounding the assassination and the outbreak of the Great War within the region. Debates of the origins of the First World War frequently enter everyday political life, even 100 years after the war. To better comprehend the neuralgic relationship between the First World War and modern Balkan politics, one must understand that for many Serbs, the failure of the West to prevent the breakup of Yugoslavia was viewed as reneging on the deal made at Versailles. For them, 
it reopened a Pandora's box of national self-determination. Although such views seemingly fly in the face of the obvious fact that Slobodan Milosevic's use of greater Serb nationalism directly led to Yugoslavia's breakup, they do reflect an all too common perception that continues to motivate political choices as demonstrated by public pronouncements of Serb officials throughout the 1990s. For the Albanians, Bosniaks, Croats, Macedonians, and Slovenes, as well as the numerous other national minority groups that live or have lived in the successor states of the former Yugoslavia, the relationship is equally controversial as their experience of the Great War was different from that of the Serbs. Bosnian Serb assassin Gavrilo Princip, what am I, oh, there we go, a self-described terrorist offers a prime example of how, such divis how divisive such questions can be. For many, his is a cut and dried case that seemingly offers two only possible explanations. Number one, Princip as a national hero, or two, Princip as a terrorist operating on instructions from Serbia. A third, more nuanced explanation would contradict political interpretations on which nation building myths are based. To see how these competing interpretations have played out, one need only follow their evolution in Sarajevo. In response to the June 1914 assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie in Sarajevo, crowds of Catholics, Muslims, Protestants, and Jews went on a two-day rampage through the city and other parts of the Habsburg monarchy, attacking Serb businesses, homes, schools, and church buildings. Three years later, in 1917, on the third anniversary of the assassination, Habsburg officials erected a monument to Franz Ferdinand and Sophie on the corner of the Latin Bridge, the, uh, which is known also as the Latina Brücke and Latinska Trupria, and of the Apelkai Street, right across from Schiller's Delicatessen, where Princip stood when the Archduke's car stopped unexpectedly in front of him and he pulled the trigger. This is where the car stopped big bronze plaque in the street, and Mr. Prince would have stood probably right about there. <clears throat> in addition to the 10 meter high monument with a bronze medallion of the couple, a rectangular ornamental plate the size of a car was set in Franz Josef's Gasse at the spot where the shooting had occurred, with a marble plaque placed high up on the wall of the delicatessen to commemorate where the couple, quote, died a martyr's death by treasonous hands. You can see the plaque right there. <clears throat> After the First World War, the victorious Serbian army dismantled the monument. Yugoslavia's King Alexander Karadjordjevic, who would himself become a victim of regicide by a nationally motiv motivated terrorist in 1934, refused to officially countenance a monument to the assassins fearing reactions from foreign capitals, capitals and the signal this might send to would-be assassins within his own country. Nonetheless, in 1920, the bodies of Princip and his conspirators were returned from their graves in Czechoslovakia and Bosnia via a special train to a triumphant, unofficial, posthumous welcome in Sarajevo, where they were reburied together in the Serbian Orthodox Cemetery with their martyred hero, Bogdan Jerajic. Here's the marble plaque that stands there today. You can see the reflection of some buildings across the street. It's very well maintained and highly polished. Due to official concerns over foreign reactions to this reburial, it was only in 1930 that a black marble plaque with gold Cyrillic lettering was unveiled on the wall high above the spot where Princip had stood. It read, quote, Princip proclaimed freedom on St. Vitus's day, June 28, 1914, unquote. Although the Royal Yugoslav government did not officially approve, this plaque clearly represented the near unanimous thinking of Serbs and Montenegrins and government officials turned a blind eye. The plaque did not survive the 1941 German invasion and it was removed and presented to Adolf Hitler for his 52nd birthday that year. You can see uh, the Fuhrer with the plaque that had been presented to him that was taken from the wall in Sarajevo. In 1945, following the recent liberation of Yugoslavia from the Wehrmacht, the new partisan-led leadership held a mass meeting in Sarajevo 
on May 7, 1945, and erected a marble plaque with the red five-pointed partisan star. The Cyrillic lettering read, the youth of Bosnia and Herzegovina dedicate this plaque as a symbol of eternal gratitude to Gavrilo Princip and his comrades, fighters against the Germanic invaders, end quote. Tito's Yugoslavia lionized Princip and the other conspirators as national heroes and martyrs whose sacrifice enabled the liberation of South Slavs from Habsburg occupation and their unification in one South Slav state. On June 27, 1953, the location of Schiller's delicatessen at the corner of Franz Josef Street and Apelkai was turned into a young Bosnia museum with external signage in Cyrillic, socialist realist reliefs in the windows, and shoe prints embedded in concrete at the spot from which Gavrilo Princip fired the fatal shots. You can see the footprints here. A new Cyrillic plaque above the shoe prints read, quote, from this spot on June 28, 1914, Gavrilo Princip expressed with his shot the national protest against tyranny and the eternal striving of our peoples for freedom, end quote. The Latin bridge was now commonly referred to as Princip's Bridge on tourist brochures and maps, although it does not appear to have been officially renamed. As socialist Yugoslavia began to violently break apart in the early 1990s, Princip became a highly polarizing litmus test, especially in the polemics leading up to Bosnia and Herzegovina's 1992 independence. During the 1992 to 1995 Serbian siege of Sarajevo, the plaque and shoe prints were removed and the bridge was redubbed the Latin Bridge. In the years following the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement, the museum was recast with a rather neutral focus on what is called the era of, quote, Habsburg occupation, unquote, covering the period from 1878 to 1918. The signs on the outside of the museum are now in the Latin alphabet and simply read musee and museum. In 2004, a simple bilingual plaque was in installed both in Serbo-Croatian and English using the Latin alphabet that reads, from this place on June 28, 1914, Gavrilo Princip assassinated the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Franz Ferdinand and his wife. Ten years later, the question of how to treat the legacy of Gavrilo Princip continued to polarize as Sarajevo and Europe began planning the 100th anniversary commemorative events. Although there was universal condemnation among all European countries, including Serbia and Russia, of the assassination when it took place in 1914, for Serbs, Princip is a national hero and part of the founding mythology of both Serbia and Yugoslavia. To describe his, him as anything else is usually condemned as anti-Serb by Serbs' cultural and political elites. At the same time, Serbia goes to great lengths to downplay or disavow any official connection between Belgrade and the Sarajevo assassination, fearing this would tarnish Serbia's image in the 21st century and make it appear to have sponsored a terrorist act against a neighbor, justifying the dual monarchy's ultimatum and eventual attack. Because the victorious powers were allied with Serbia and acquiesced in the formation of Yugoslavia at Versailles, they had, by default, adopted the official Serb-Yugoslav narrative that Serbia created Yugoslavia by defeating the Habsburg Empire, thus liberating and unifying the South Slavs in Yugoslavia. During the wars of the 1990s, Gavrilo Princip became an iconic figure for Bosnia's Serbs, and they saw him as someone who represented the Serbian struggle against oppression. This narrative remains unchanged among Bosnia's Serbs. In contrast to the Serbs, many of Serbia's then wartime allies continue to condemn Princip's act as one of terrorism, although one that was not sufficiently serious so as to warrant Austria-Hungary's ultimatum or subsequent declaration of war. For those countries allied with Austria-Hungary, a common view emerged that Princip was a terrorist doing the bidding of Serbia's government and that Serbia's response to the ultimatum was disingenuous. Although one would hope that time would heal these polarized views, the preparatory events for the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the assassination in Sarajevo and the successor states to the former Yugoslavia demonstrated that even today this question touches a raw nerve, not only among the Balkan Slavs, but also inside the European Union and Russia. 
the incorrect interpretation could call into question long-established popular narratives that define today's Europe. In Serbia and Bosnia's Serb-majority entity, Republika Srpska, Serbs cried foul at efforts to portray Princip as a terrorist and launched their own commemorations of young Bosna as heroes. On April 23, 2014, the celebrated Serb nationalist film director Emir Kusturica, himself of Bosnian Muslim parentage, unveiled a statue of Princip in the northern Serbian town of Tovarishevo. There we go. <clears throat> While throughout 2014, numerous pro-Princip conferences were held in Serbia and Bosnia's Republika Srpska, Russia closed ranks with Serbia's interpretation. For the formerly Habsburg, Catholic majority countries that split off from the former Yugoslavia, that is Croatia and Slovenia, the Principe's terrorist narrative tends to be more pronounced and is often used to support claims that Serbs are terrorists and hence guilty for the wars and atrocities of the 1990s. This tendency is also seen in the Muslim majority areas of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where the Muslims, that is the Bosniaks, frequently express the opinion that were it not for Gavrilo Princip, today they would have Austrian passports and be inside the European Union. The abiding importance of this question to 21st century Europe is seen in the reactions of the former great powers toward the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the assassination in Sarajevo itself. <clears throat> Here you can see the street corner as it is today. You see it says the street corner that started the 20th century. And on one side is Gavrilo Princip, and on the other is Franz Ferdinand, because this was truly the event that started the 21st century. Here is a plaque, and here is a spot where the Gavrilo Princip would have stood. And here are some Bosnian football fans <laughs> wearing the national team's color. <laughs> Although advanced planning for a scholarly conference to commemorate the assassination by the University of Sarajevo's Historical Institute began in 2000, fierce disagreements broke out between France and Austria in, 19, in 2013, as each struggled to wrest control of the commemoration, that is, its interpretation, from each other. In diplomatic circles, there was fear that a new world war would break out between France and Austria over the matter. Reverting to old historical patterns, the Sarajevo Historical Institute sought assistance from Austria, while Serbia and Bosnia's Serbs sought support from France to oppose the conference. Although France gained control of European Union funding for the commemoration, the University of Sarajevo teamed up with scholarly institutions in Austria, Bulgaria, Croatia, Germany, Hungary, Macedonia, Slovenia, and the University of Utah to hold a three-day academic conference in Sarajevo one week before the commemoration. The conference included over 100 scholars from North America, Europe, Russia, Turkey, Ukraine, and all the Balkan states. Official Serbian and French institutions, as well as French scholars, were notably absent although four Serb scholars defied official Belgrade and participated. To seal its historiographic victory, Austria sent the Vienna Philharmonic to play, <clears throat> to, where am I here? Uh, to play a concert on June 28, 1914 in the recently renovated Sarajevo City Hall. The date and venue were rich with symbolism. This was the last building that Franz Ferdinand and Sophia visited prior to their deaths and as the location of the National Library and Archive of Bosnia and Herzegovina during Communist Yugoslavia, it had been one of the first targets of Serb artillery during the 1992-1995 siege. Choosing the precise date of the assassination for the concert was also heavy with symbolism. Croats and Bos Bosniaks interpreted Austria's moves as a message that it shared a common interpretation of events and that Vienna offers support against perceived future Serb aggression. France made do with a Tour de France supported bicycle tour around Sarajevo. <clears throat> the day before the commemoration, Sarajevo placed a makeshift replica of the Graf in Stift touring car used by Franz Ferdinand and Sophie at the assassination site with two actors dressed as Franz Ferdinand and Sophie. 
pardon the bad quality, these were taken with my mobile phone. <laughs> Large crowds of tourists gathered as a Gavrilo Principe actor, dressed in a white John Travolta disco outfit, wielded a fluorescent orange water pistol. The night of June 28th, following the Vienna Philharmonic concert, an official commemoration began on the Latin Bridge. It included a sound and light show, a children's choir, popular actors, singers from Turkey, and a Cossack choir from Siberia. Bosnia, Bosnia's Serbs commemorated the assassination quite differently, unveiling a statue to Gavrilo Princip in the Serb-held suburb of eastern Sarajevo on June 27th. You can see that the uh, portrayal and the feelings regarding Princip are substantially different of those that occurred in downtown Sarajevo. The following day, St. Vitus's Dan, Day, or Vidovdan, the president of Bosnia's Republic of Srpska, Milorad Dodik, along with Serbia's Prime Minister Aleksandr Vucic and Serbian Orthodox Patriarch Irene, gathered to open a tourist attraction in the Bosnian town of Visegrad. Dodik spoke of the Serb struggle for freedom in the past, stated that the Serbs in Bosnia are not yet free, and said that Republika Srpska would soon have, quote, autonomy and then independence. Today, we could well ask if the great powers are repeating the mistakes of 1914. The First World War, in large part, grew out of one country's overreaction to what was at the time labeled a terrorist attack. It also grew out of nationalism, as well as the failure of the great powers, and this is perhaps one of the most important points, to comprehend that the rules of the established international order had changed without their noticing it. Indeed, by 1914, the system that had been established at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 had long ceased to exist. In fact, some could argue that with the unification of Germany in 1870, in, in, by 1870 and Germany's triumph over France in 1871, that the system had been completely put to rest. However, no one seemed to notice it, and everyone was behaving according to the old rules in 1914. Today, the world has undergone a similar transformation. The United States and Europe are operating within a new world order that they do not understand, one which bears many similarities to that of the post-1815 concert of Europe. They have become distracted by a series of crises throughout the world, all of which consume vital national resources and all of which have weakened their economies and militaries, as well as destroyed any moral high ground from which they could have hoped to operate. To better understand how the world has shifted since 1989, let us turn once again to the Balkans, as this is one of the few regions in the world where the national interests of major powers collide along their immediate peripheries. Following, oh, getting ahead of myself. Following the NATO, US, and EU interventions of the 1990s in the Balkans, Washington and Bo Bosnia created policy based on the assumption that they were the only game in town, that the only option available to the Balkan countries, Bosnia, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Serbia, and Albania, was integration with the European Union and NATO. For Washington, this proved convenient as it could now hand the unwanted Balkan stepchild to Brussels, while the US took care of its other interests. This policy remains largely unchanged to this day. However, in the meantime, the ground shifted. A resurgent Russia acquired much of the region's energy infrastructure, including oil refineries, gas station retailers, and gas pipelines, and began building military logistic bases in the region while modernizing its armed forces. <coughs> it also began to oppose further European Union enlargement and further NATO enlargement. Turkey became a major trading partner and investor, influencing people of all religions in all areas of the former Ottoman Empire, which was backed up with over a decade of 7% annual economic growth. So too, Ankara wields outsized value as an indispensable strategic partner if the U.S. wishes to resolve problems in the Middle East, Central Asia, the Black Sea region, or the Caucasus. Without Insulik Air Base, the U.S. would be helpless in the Middle East or in Afghanistan 
or Central Asia. China has appeared on the scene, offering aid worth tens of billions of dollars <clears throat> while investing heavily in energy, mineral exploitation, and transportation infrastructure. The United Arab Emirates, flush with petrodollars, are also investing, purchasing prime agricultural real estate to feed their populations, as well as residential and commercial real estate. They've also purchased Serbia's national air carrier. In contrast to the EU or US, none of these countries has attached strings to its aid that would force unwanted reforms of corrupt institutions or the curtailment of human rights abuses. All are following classic patterns of the mercantilist behavior reminiscent of the 18th and 19th centuries, patterns the US itself began to rediscover and use more actively beginning in the 1980s. So too, the ongoing Eurozone crisis has made EU membership less attractive. No longer is Brussels the only game in town. And Balkan politicians increasingly speak of the Iceland scenario. For those of you who don't know what Iceland has done since 2008, I would suggest you read up on it because they have shown that there is a different way of doing things. Clearly, Western policy in that part of the world has come undone. Why is this important? Because this is on the immediate periphery of the Western alliance. On the macro level, a significant change long in the making occurred only just recently. Since the Second World War, the entire international system was based on principles enshrined in the Atlantic Charter that were later enshrined in Bretton Woods. These included not only the United Nations, but also the major international economic arrangements and international financial institutions, such as the IMF, the World Bank, the G General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, and now the World Trade Organization, and later such things as the Asian Development Bank. Conveniently for the United States, all these institutions served US economic e needs. The US held majority stake uh, shareholdership in many of the institutions, and conveniently, most of these were headquartered in Washington or New York. It has been these institutions that have represented U.S. soft power since 1945 and have permitted the U.S. to wield such outsized influence in developing and developed countries. Since early 2014, the BRICS, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Singapore, have begun to seek alternatives, and they have openly discussed establishing an alternative economic and financial system. Despite an abortive start, the recent announcement in December by China that it would bail out Russia not only undid a great deal of Western efforts to curtail Russia's uh, policies following the recent adventures in the Crimea and Ukraine, but so too, China also recently gave aid to Argentina and Venezuela. This effectively, and I would ask that you take note of this because this is a very important uh, event in the world, probably one of the more significant events in the past 60 to 70 years. This effectively marks the death of the post Bretton Woods era. And it means the increasing irrelevance of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the Asian Development Bank, and a number of other international trade and financial institutions. It also marks the beginning of the end for America's linchpin role in the world economy. China is now becoming the lender of last resort, as seen in 2011 and 2012, when Brussels looked to Beijing to save the euro bond markets by massive bond purchases. And we already know the very, very important role that Beijing plays in financing United States debt. So why are the Balkans still important in all of this? The region is still combating the ghosts of the First and Second Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913, as well as the ghosts of 1918. Albanians want Western Macedonia, Northern Kosovo, and Southern Serbia's Preshovo Valley. Bulgaria, which is an EU NATO member, wants Eastern Macedonia. Greece, also an EU NATO member, wants Southern Macedonia. 
Croatia, an e also an EU NATO member, has its eyes set on the western part of, of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, known as Herzegovina. Hungary, which is also an EU NATO member, has its eyes set on recovering six municipalities in northern Serbia that have a Hungarian majority population. It would take only a small spark to send it, set this tinderbox alight, and it could potentially pull in the Western Alliance. I like to jokingly say it's all about peace. If any of you ever saw the Mel Brooks movie, To Be or Not To Be, there's a famous song in it in which Mel Brooks uh, plays the role of Hitler, and he sings a little song in which he says, all I want is peace. A little piece of Poland, a little piece of France, a little piece of Switzerland and Austria, perchance. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> Russia, on the other hand, is in an envious no-lose position where it can back Serbia and Bosnia's Serb entities should they decide to prove adventurous. And for the past four years, Bosnia's Serbs have spoken openly of secession. History has shown us that major wars usually start when the vital national interest of a country is threatened. That is, when an event takes place that impacts its immediate periphery. Events that occur in faraway places may provoke concern, particularly if one power is locked in a proxy war with another. Yet such, yet such distant events have rarely, if ever, provoked conflict among great powers. If we look at today's crisis spots, <laughs> Afghanistan, Congo, Iran, Iraq, ISIS, Libya, Nigeria, the Sahel, Somalia, South Sudan, Syria, Venezuela, or Yemen, to name but a few. Not a single one of these, with the exception of perhaps the Ukraine, holds the potential to create a major world conflict. The reason is simple. None of these areas represents a direct threat to the vital national interest of any of today's great powers. Although concerned politicians often express the desire to re utilize the recently developed doctrine of the responsibility to protect, also known as R2P, more often than not, humanitarian intervention never occurs. But the one area where the interests of great powers does collide is the Balkans. And distractions in the Ukraine and the Baltic states aside, it is there that the greatest mischief could occur. In closing, let us consider the words Gavrilo Princip carved in the wall of his cell while imprisoned in Theresienstadt. Today they are written on a prominent piece of graffiti on a wall in downtown Belgrade that I frequently walk past. These words read, you can see them here, written in Cyrillic and already someone has graffitied over the graffiti. They read, our shades shall roam through Vienna, haunt through the palace, frighten the nobles. As we look at the world today, it is frightening to think just how prescient these words have become. Thank you very much. So we probably have time for just a couple of questions. Uh, just so you know, we, we have a wireless mic here because we're recording. Uh, we'd ask you to use that microphone. You can form a little queue for the time we have remaining. Tell us your name, what you're studying, and again, if you'd like to ask a question. Boy, this is like the first few minutes of Fast and Testimony meeting. <laughs> if there are no questions, oh, darn. Hi. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Warren Fraser, yeah. National Relations. Um, this kind of goes back to earlier in your um, talk about, um, said something along the lines of, in 1914, the concerns of the powers were more uh, about, uh, about like privilege and patronage, and they weren't really, they didn't really have an eye towards reform. But I had a question about Franz Ferdinand, mm -hmm. and um, one of his, not really advisors, but um, Popovici, the like a Romanian sort of intellectual, uh, gave him this idea of, it, it sounds silly in English, but the United States of Greater Austria basically sort of federalizing the empire, which was something that it appeared um, the Archduke had kind of latched onto. So 
with, I guess, with that in mind, how, what kind of effect would that have? Would that sort of neutralize that, or that just be putting it off? So you're you're uh, scratching the surface of a very long-going and very deep debate. First of all, let me just say Popovici is a Serbian name. Um, that would have belonged to a Serb who was within the Austro-Hungarian Empire pro living in what is today part of Romania. Um, there was a big argument in Austria-Hungary at the time because Austria-Hungary at that point bore a great many resemblances to today's Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was comprised of two entities with an independent third district. And there was significant friction between the Germanic speaking parts of the country and the Magyar, that is the Hungarian-speaking parts of the country. Um, the Hungarians controlled larger swaths of territory if we were to actually sit down and count the number of square kilometers, but the Austrians were the ones sitting on the throne, and um, they controlled primarily the military, and after all, it was a hereditary monarchy, and when the monarch was uh, God's representative on earth, uh, as what had been the case with so many Habsburg monarchs up until Napoleon's time when they were the Holy Roman Emperors, um, their authority was quite absolute and quite unquestionable. There was a massive argument going on within the empire itself, which was called a dual empire because of the power sharing arrangement. Hungary had its own parliament, Austria had its own parliament, the joint state institutions were actually quite weak. The only real power that could bring them together was an imperial decision or edict telling them to behave and to get their acts together. Um, at this time, there were substantial arguments going on within the Austro-Hungarian Empire about what future direction it would take. The Hungarians had embarked on a program of hardcore majorization where they were trying to discourage most of their non-Hungarian subjects from using their native languages and instead force them to take Hungarian names and to speak the Hungarian language. This was problematic because most of the people within what was then the Kingdom of Hungary uh, were non-Hungarian native speakers and many of them were South Slavic speakers. So there was this debate going on, and Franz Ferdinand was in charge, was the le considered the leader of a camp that would have um, essentially weakened the pro-Hungarian camp. He was looking to go from a dualist solution of a monarchy, that is an Austrian and a Hungarian part, to a trialist solution that would have taken some of the land, stripped some of the Slavic lands off of the Hungarian empire, put them together with Bosnia and Herzegovina, and when I say some of the Slavic lands, I mean most of what is today Vojvodina, Slavonia, Croatia, um, and created a third entity. So that it wouldn't have been a dual monarchy, it would have been a trial monarchy. And uh, the idea was to dilute the, the Hungarian strength. So this is actually a very, very deep topic, and there's a lot you can read about it. So uh, sorry for the, for the long answer, but it's not an easy um, question. <laughs> Travis Dolan, a major. Uh, towards the end of your remarks today, you talked about a number of border disputes and uh, sort of irredentist feelings amongst a, a lot of Balkan states. Uh, my question is, um, what factors or forces do you uh, think are, are keeping those, those conflicts cold at this time? The things that are keeping them cold at this time are, first of all, uh, the, there's still a bit of war fatigue. It's only been 20 years since the war in Bosnia ended, and it's been, what, 15 years since the, we had the intervention in Kosovo, and then we were also intervening in Macedonia and South Serbia in 2000, 2001. So most of those countries there are, there's a, there's a sense of fatigue, um, with the exception of Kosovo, where the Kosovo Albanians seem more than willing to, uh, to, to go active at a moment's notice. Um, in regard to what's keeping the rest of them <laughs> in place, first of all, it's something called money. They are all, none of these countries has yet bottomed, bottomed out economically from the 2008 world economic crisis. They're still going downhill. This includes Croatia. Slovenia is also sliding. So all of the former Yugoslavia and Albania and Greece are all posting more or less negative growth numbers or zero growth numbers. So they simply don't have the economic wherewithal. Second of all, as I said, there's a huge amount of war fatigue. For those of you who've lived through a war, been in a war, been in a conflict zone, who've been under fire, you know what I'm talking about. No one w in their right mind wants war. Um, 
so there's just this big fatigue. Third of all, you have the security apparatus of NATO that has been, as we, if we go back to the very first, uh, how do we, can this go backward? Yeah. If we go back to the very first um, slide, you can see all the great powers sitting on the kettle. We have had NATO sitting on the kettle lid uh, since 1995 in Bosnia and 1999 in the broader Balkans as a whole. The difficulty is troop strength in Bosnia-Herzegovina, to give you an example, has gone from a high of 60,000 troops and today consists of 600 troops, uh, half of whom are, of, are Austrian and the other half of whom are Turks, which I'm sure is making Eugene of Savoy roll over in his grave at the thought of Turks and Austrians sharing a common military base. Um, so the NATO deterrent has declined substantially and is almost no longer there because Kosovo has as its backup plan if something goes awry that it will receive reinforcements from Bosnia and Bosnia's plans are that they will receive reinforcements from Kosovo and neither uh, country has a plan B or NATO doesn't have a plan B for either country short of calling on the NATO forces to send in rapid reaction units. So. Connor Mills, uh, supply chain management major. Uh, so I was just curious, based on com how the outcome of uh, the assassination of Ferdinand, like how it's affected the world today, do you think most people see, um, I'm sorry, remind me of the guy's name that killed him? Gavrilo Princip. Gavrilo Princip. Do you think most people see him as a terrorist or as a hero? He called himself a terrorist. However, so you have to keep in mind yeah. The, the definition of terrorism in 1914 and the definition of terrorism today are not the same things. Okay. In 1914, terrorism, as it was defined then, was rampant. It typically consisted of a form of social revolt or political revolt, and it was taking place throughout Europe and the United States, where lone individuals, many of them anarchists inspired by Bakunin um, or, or others, were going and... Uh, or, uh, and basically killing heads of state. And we had a Russian Tsar assassinated. We had the wife of Emperor Franz Josef of uh, Austria assassinated. We had a whole list of prime ministers and presidents of European countries assassinated by these typically uh, working class anarchist um, or, or uh, socialist, often students or workers. We even had a US president assassinated by one of them. So at the time, De terrorism was meant to be a political action, what they call the action of the deed, and it was carried out usually by a single person targeting a single individual of the privileged class in an effort to get them to carry out social reforms and political reforms. They were not intended as acts against broad bodies of innocent people. They were specifically targeted against individuals whom they felt were responsible for the current state of affairs. So if you want to call him a terrorist, I think today we'd refer to him as a political assassinate. Hi, I'm Julia Parker. I'm a political science minor. Uh, you talked about the failure of statesmen before World War I to recognize the threat of the Balkans and the trouble that was going to originate there, um, and how we're kind of repeating that same thing today. We've failed to realize that the rules of the game have changed. What do you think the US should change its policy today to help fix this problem? First thing we need to do is get out of conflicts where we don't have a vital national interest. And I, <laughs> and, and I don't want to go back and visit re recent history and all the mistakes the U.S. has made in its intervention and uh, in some cases unjustified wars in a number of countries or some of the ongoing activities the U.S. is carrying out in the name of either a war on terror or a war on drugs. Um, suffice it to say, the, the war on drugs has created a massive refugee flood uh, in the American continents that has hit our borders, and we are unable, our American politicians are unable to deal with this refugee flood crisis, and often instead have decided to label it an immigration crisis, not understanding that it's military actions by the United States and Central and Latin America that are creating these massive refugee flows in many uh, regards. The same holds true in other parts of the world, and these have spillover impact, and they impact narcotics trafficking, human trafficking, uh, weapons smuggling, 
Um, they enable uh, the creation of rogue states. We now see the formation of ISIS. ISIS could not have been created without the United States intervention. Um, Osama bin Laden could never have appeared without United States assistance. We go back time and again and we ask ourselves, why are we there? What are our goals? And politicians typically tend to think in terms of a short two-year election cycle, sometimes a four-year cycle. If you look at the language of the original Dayton Peace Agreement, it called for all U.S. forces to be out of Bosnia-Herzegovina after one year. That was done to mollify the U.S. Congress. There is still a NATO headquarters run by a U.S. general with the U.S. staff sitting in Sarajevo today. Um, there have been too many interventions where we go in uh, saying we're not going to do nation building, not understanding that intervening in a foreign country is a bit like walking into a China shop. If you break it, you bought it, and you have to pick up the pieces. And so often we've wanted to go in, break things, and not buy it and not pick up the pieces. And I think U.S. government should realize in terms of foreign policy that if it is going to go in and intervene, any intervention has to be long-term, sustained, that will last for three to four to five decades and require enormous amounts of resources, enormous amounts of blood and treasure, and that we have to, from the very beginning, decide to take upon ourselves uh, the responsibility to make positive change happen. Otherwise, we shouldn't be intervening. Thank you. I'm Jake Hermanson. I'm a I'm a Russian and international studies um, major. Two thumbs uh, up. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just got back from my mission, actually, from December in December from Moscow. Um, and so I was wondering, you talked a little bit about how um, people in um, in the Balkans or like the different countries around that area, they have their eyes on different pieces of land and, and other things like that. And you talked about how Russian um, the Russian Federation kind of said that they would back up Ser like they could back up Serbia if it came down to conflict and stuff like that. And so I was just wondering what would um, if if conflicts were to happen in those in those areas, what do you think um, that would mean for the relationships between the United States and Russia and just those states in general? Would the U.S. get involved, or um, would it be? As usual, it would take the United States a long time to respond. Mm -hmm. um, it would take Europe quite a while to respond, and similar to what we saw um, in the Balkans in the time leading up to the First World War, where there was a guerrilla, a long-term guerrilla insurgency lasting from 1904 to 1908 in Macedonia that was finally stopped when the great powers put their foot down. And then we had the two Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913 that proved to be major game changers. Uh, there will be a series of simmering conflicts on the periphery before the great powers finally start to say, hey, this is affecting our vital national interest. The same thing happened with Adolf Hitler. There were a series of simmering conflicts around the periphery that no one could quite muster the political will to take seriously, whether it be the Sudetenland in 1930s, I mean, excuse me, the Rhineland in 1936, the Sudetenland in 1938, the Anschluss of Austria, um, finally, it wasn't until they invaded Poland that people began to wake up. Um, so I think a similar situation will play itself out where it will start off with a series of low-level um, conflicts that will spread until uh, it's no longer possible to ignore them. And they will be ignored um, until they see that these conflicts are taking place on the periphery and they have the the, the possibility of expanding directly into the core zones of the greater powers. Do you think that the situation in Crimea is leading up to that at all? Well, Crimea and, uh, and the Donbass region of Ukraine are simply uh, advertisements. They're, it's like a preview in a movie theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, this has been evident for more than a year before Russia actually began to support the uh, insurgency uh, in those regions. And what is interesting is that Putin has followed play by play every single step that Slobodan Milosevic did during the breakup of Yugoslavia, successfully using the same military tactics, the same use of artificially created local um, forces, uh, supporting them, and the same manner of playing with the international community. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks for your questions. And join me again in thanking Dr. Lyons.